our Wednesday night folks that watch us on the, they'll be wondering where we're at if we're late. Just, uh, like, oh, late. We got a prayer. Everybody got a prayer list? Yeah. It's so good to see you all tonight. We, uh, we took three Wednesday nights for our prayer stations to pray for our revival. And so uh, it's kind of been out of our, our regular routine. So it's good to see you all all back here tonight. Uh, as you look over your prayer list, got a couple. Somebody's already asked about Chris. He went to have his nerve induction test today, and the doctor did not show. So he had to turn around and come back home. Uh, and then Sarah has gallbladder surgery tomorrow. So make sure you kind of... Uh, 6.30. 6.30. Ooh, that's so early. Well, that's when she's got to be there. She's got to be there at 6.30. Okay. Hey, Jim. Howdy, howdy. So, uh, let's kind of take a moment look over. Anybody got any updates on some, some folks? Uh, Atlanta, yeah. Jenny Sue Horman. Question was asked: Who? What's the connection? Who? Yeah. Help, please. Do you know? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I asked as well. Who is she? Okay. I know she was Does any, anybody know spoke. anything about Jenny Sue Horman? I, I'm so I'm so sorry. I a bunch of different people, but it's not. Okay. Okay, Ronnie Sanders. Uh, also, Mary Davidson. She has really. She has breathing problems anyway, and uh, she was she was doing better, and her breathing treatments were going good. She was actually back to church, you know, for a few weeks. But she's been out the last, I think maybe three, two to three Sundays, and she's not doing well at all with her breathing. And so remember, remember uh, her, Miss Mary. Um, I haven't heard anything if she's gone to the doctor or anything. Uh, no updates. Maybe if, if Tammy's uh, watching or sees this, she can give an update in the comment section. Um, my sister texted me yesterday. My next, well, I have both my sisters are older than me, but not our, my, not our, we call our oldest, our old, old sister, not my old sister, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we pick on her because she's older than we are, but my sister Dixie, and she, she had a, a kidney stone <laughs> removed today, and so uh, she did good though, she's at home, and so uh, we don't need to put her on the prayer list, but I just wanted to kind of mention that, so she's recovering. Um, I have not heard uh, uh, any other updates other than Chris. I, I texted with him today and, and knew about his test, and uh, I guess Miss Charlotte's doing, still continuing to progress. And yeah, I talked to her. To church like you're saying, yeah, I feel she's, yeah. She's gonna try to come to Sunday school. I thought Sunday. we might see her roll in soon. Yeah, and so. and she's hoping the doctor will. Re she goes back to the doctor Monday. Okay. And hoping he'll release her. Okay. So Good deal. They figured the uh, Patrick said I told her that he thought they they have done as much as they can do. Okay. So. Uh, Earl Wayne said that his mom was still having uh, blood pressure problems Sunday. That one day it's two twenty over one hundred ninety, well, and then it drops, and it's. Wow. I mean, he said it was just all over the place. That's okay. on the continuing prayer needs, Beverly Davis. If, if you want to make a note by her name there. I was hoping she'd be moved. She's moving to, uh, they're going to open that place at Paducah soon. So okay. Hoping soon. That'd be good. Closer. Yeah, that'd be good. Got a great, great, uh, Willie Snow, uh, <laughs> that's a great answer to prayer. Wasn't, wasn't cancer, no surgery, and just woohoo. So uh, we are uh, excited. But I guess uh, she's very, very happy. Uh, I would be too. <laughs> that's yeah. great, great news. But, you know, folks have been praying for her. And uh, 
Anybody have any additions that they want to add to their prayer list? My uncle's been taking uh, those chemo treatments and radiation both at the same time. And, uh, so far, he's tolerated those treatments real well and he's not felt bad, hadn't been sick or anything. Yeah. So. That's Hobart Powers. He's on the about a little below midway on the, the from the top there, James's uncle, as he continues to yeah. to respond well. Seems to be doing pretty good. Uh, doesn't feel bad and hasn't been sick, so just that's a blessing. He just yeah, he just I don't know for sure where. But I believe Marty Bass has been moved to like a, I'm going to say like a nursing he facility. Has. And he is on, he's doing rehab, and he's going to be such a problem. Yeah. He's, he's such doing a rehab on his foot. Okay. The, being in the bed for so long, that ventilator affected his leg, his foot or something. Right. Okay. I call it like a limp, I don't know, but. Oh, well, he, but he is off the, yes. He's, he's off, he off is the off the ventilator. Yes. So off the ventilator, so we'll that boom. He said, Chrissy said he's had a long road ahead of him, but he was going to get to come home. Rehab, is it rehab first and then home? Yes. Rehab and then home. Okay. Yeah. And the rehab is mostly for the his foot. His foot, okay. Yeah. And so a lot better. Gerald's birthday is next Wednesday, and I know he's not with us anymore, but Hazel has been absent for a little while. If y'all think of her, send her a call. Toward her call. Call, yeah. call her. Yeah. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to believe it's a... Let's, uh, let's pray, and uh, then we'll get started into our, our study. Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, God, thank you uh, for your love and your grace and your mercy that you've given us another day. And Father, we, uh, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for uh, in our lives, God. We, we just thank you that we can be here tonight together with one another studying your word father and we're thankful that we can and we can intercede on other people's behalves that we have the <coughs> privilege god that we can we can we can lift up our friends our family father we, we can pray for people that that we don't even know personally god that, that we can we can bring that need to you, Father, and we can lay it at your feet. And we know that you are the good physician, Father. That you hear those prayers. That you move mightily. Father, the scripture testifies to the power of prayer and how you move when, when, when your children pray, Father. Father, I lift up each and every individual need here father father we have families that have lost loved ones we have families that are having difficulty people that are having difficulty breathing father we have folks that are still battling covid or maybe the the aftermath or the after effects of covid father we have people that are battling cancer Father, we have people that are going in for surgery. We have people that, Lord, they just feel bad and and and, and they, they just want to know what's going on, Lord, and that they can get some test results. 
Father, we have folks of all ages, from little bitty children to, to adults, God. The, the needs are many, Lord. And Father, we know that we can take each and every one. God, you, you know what's going on in each one of their lives, Father. You, you know them because you made them. And nothing is, gets past you, God. And Father, we pray that you will move in each and every situation, Lord, that, that your name will be glorified, that your will will be done. Father, we have folks that, that are lonely, that have lost a loved one. <clears throat> Father, we have those that can no longer live at home, and Father, they, they may feel isolated or lonely because they can't be with their church family or they can't come to church anymore, God. I just pray that you will be with them and comfort them. Father, we have the ministries that we partner with, Lord, that they're on, they're on the front lines every day, Lord, just trying to minister to people the best that they can, Lord. We pray that you will give them the resources that they need to help folks and to share the love of Christ, Father, every day. Lord, we lift up our church, Lord, that, that uh, we, we pray that you will be with us, Father, that we will continue to seek your face and seek your will, Lord, and follow you in the direction that, that you want us to go. God, that we will get out of the way, that we will just say, you know what, I, 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 by faith I'm following you, God. It, 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 it might, we might not have a clue what that looks like, Father. We might not know what direction that is, Father, it may be different. It, it may be somewhat the same, Lord. We don't know, but we need to just to say, Father, it, it's okay because we trust you. And we want what you want. Father, tonight, just be with us as we study your word, Lord. That it will be alive, it will be new, and it will be fresh. And God, we just pray that you will speak to us tonight through your word. Father, if there are spiritual needs on this prayer list, and there are. Father, some of these people know you as their Lord and Savior, some do not. And God, we know to you the spiritual need is far greater than the physical need. And Father, I, find, I pray that they will find spiritual healing. They will find spiritual, a, a, a new birth if they're lost, Father. Or maybe they are yours, God, and, and, and they just have drifted so far away from you and, and, and they kind of just started doing their own thing, Lord, but whatever their situation or circumstance is, Father, I pray that it will point them back to you. God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. It came, became official today. Michael is going to become a grandfather, and I'm going to become a great-grandfather to a little girl. Oh, they're officially a new little, a little Jenkins. Yeah. Yeah, a little girl. Just have a new one to hold yeah. up. And I tell you what, Grandmama, Great Grandmama Jenkins is about to turn the handstand. <laughs> She's been doing backward flips already. Well, all right. <laughs> so Michael gonna have a little more, a little more gray hair in his beard. Mm -hmm. Another child, <laughs> another child to raise. That's not. Hey, he, he's doing good. I tell you what, I, I like the, I like the he, pictures of him and Marshall together. I'm like, that's pretty, pretty good. I'm like, Michael's had a pretty good day. <laughs> He was a cute little skeleton. Yeah. Like he has rest. his hands for a long time. Because sometimes, Marshall, nothing's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, just, you know. He stopped. He's a guy that knows what he wants. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, if you have your Bibles tonight and you're hand your hand out. Jim, did you get a handout and everything? Yes, I did. Thank uh, you. Revelation chapter 4. We have been doing a study on worship. So I'm going to need you to kind of, uh, we took the three weeks off to pray for revival, so basically the month of October. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of need those of you that have been following along and everything 
I'm going to kind of need you to, 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 uh, to, to dig deep into your, your memory bank and to recall some stuff. But basically what we've done, for those of you that kind of join in with us, which is cool, uh, we've been on this journey. We've been kind of like studying the scripture to see what is real biblical worship. And we kind of start out with an overview of worship and a definition of worship and kind of what that looks like. And then we've been kind of navigating through the scripture uh, starting with uh, Lucifer and why there's a battle for our worship. Uh, everybody is a worshiper. Everybody. Everybody on this planet. There's over 7 point whatever billion people on this planet. And everyone is a worshiper. We all something. And the question is, who or what do we worship? Now, the study on worship is great, but uh, we're doing the Bible study on Sunday night for him. He says this, he says, what you value the most is what you worship. And if you want to find out what you value the most, you do an inventory of how you spend your time, your money, your resources, your affection, all those things leave a trail to a throne of your life. And you follow all those items and whatever's sitting on the throne of your life, that's what you value the most. And it could even be ourself sitting on the throne. Self-worship, that's, that's a big one. Uh, and so... Put it that way, if you don't know what you worship, it's probably yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. But, but the whole point is, is we all worship something. Now, there's only one that is worthy of worship. And that's God and God alone. And uh, here's the thing. He doesn't share his worship with anybody. It's not like, God, is it okay if I worship you 98% of the time and I kind of hang out and worship this, you know, the St. Louis Cardinals a percent of the time, you know, and, and, and the UK Wildcats and the other, you know? No. It's 100% or nothing. You worship all of me or nothing. And so we've been on this kind of journey. We've been looking at the different scripture, like in the Old Testament with, uh, with worship. We looked at Cain and Abel and their offerings that they brought, which were acts of worship. We, we've kind of traveled through to see what the prophets said about Israel and worship, tabernacle and worship. And then we've been in the New Testament, and, and Jeff got sick with uh, worship in spirit and truth from, from, from the woman at the well, you know, and, and we've talked about that, and we kind of looked at that. But we're going to kind of finish up today with worship is kind of like the final worship. It's the worship that we're going to be doing for all eternity when we get to heaven. So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to look at chapter 13 a little bit. Now, here's a disclaimer for me tonight. So if you start asking me these questions, I'm going to just say, hey, put that question on hold. Right. We are not going to dive too much into the book of Revelation itself because this is not a study on Revelation. This is a study on worship. I do have a study on Revelation, but that is to share on another date and for another time. So, everybody's curious about them some Revelation. Well, you have to put that curious on hold. We're going to look at a few things, because I want to cover some background in order to give us the context. So chapter 4 begins a heavenly perspective looking down on earth, okay? So our perspective from Revelation chapter 4 is from heaven looking down on earth. Now, the Bible has other important references to heaven in passages such as Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. Uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. Now, I just want you to think about pictures and artwork of angels. Angels are not little chubby babies with little wings. Angels are not little feminine men in white robes with wings strumming a harp on a cloud. Listen, they are mighty warriors of God, and these have six wings, and they cover their face, their feet, they fly. 
We're going to find out when we get into Revelation that the cherubim that we look at, they, they're a frightful sight for sure. Something that you'd see out of a crazy science fiction movie. And one called another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Remember, holy, holy, holy. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. I mean, picture that scene. That's just, and I said, this is Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I mean, he gets to see this vision, and he sees this, and he sees this worship, and he sees these seraphim, and, and, and he sees the, the, the sights and the sounds and everything, and he's just like, oh, wow. I'm, I'm, he's basically like, I'm, I'm garbage in the presence of this. I'm not even worried. I, I shouldn't even be here. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hands a burning coal that he would take with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And Isaiah said, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then, then I said, Here I am, send me. And so... Also, here's some other passages if you want to uh, write them down. Ezekiel 1, Exodus 25 through 32, and 35 through 40. It's talking about the tabernacle. And in describing the tabernacle, it symbolically describes heaven. And in the description of heavenly things, John uses symbols. Okay? This is where everybody gets hung up. I will say this about the book of Revelation. If I ever do a study about Revelation, I'll tell you this. It's an apocrypha writing, okay? Now, the church was being persecuted, all right? The Romans were persecuting the church. The Revelation is written to the seven churches, seven actual body of believers in those cities. And Jesus says, write this down. They were under intense persecution. So John writes in a coded language that when the churches read it, they understood what he was talking about. We read it and we're like, what in the world is he talking about? Because it's so shrouded in symbolism and mystery. They knew what he was talking about. So like it's kind of like coded language, like the military sends secret codes. If somebody intercepts that code, they don't know what they're talking about because it's coded. If the Romans would have got a hold of those letters, they would have looked at it and they're like, what is this gibberish? But the church is new. And the book of Revelation for the churches is about victory. It, it's, it's, it's not a scary book at all. If you're lost, it's scary. But it's, it's a book about God triumphing, Christ returning, and establishing his kingdom forever and ever and ever. Sin, Satan, and the devil... Uh, demons all vanquished for all eternity ne for nevermore. That's a pretty good story. And so, so John uses symbolism. And keep this in mind, not everything is symbolic. Okay? He uses symbolism, but not everything is symbolic. I did a study on the parables, and I kind of talked about parables. Parables aren't allegories. Okay? In an allegory, everything in the, alleg the, the allegory, if it mentions like uh, a water pitcher, a drop of water, a leaf falling off a tree, a pebble, and a crow. Those are all symbolic for something in the story. Well, Jesus in his parables, he, he, I'll give you an example. He'll talk, you know, the, the seeds that, that, you know, he talks about how the birds come down and snatch up the seeds, and he explains about Satan being the bird. Well, a lot of people say, well, every parable that Jesus taught about a bird, Satan's the bird. No. He's not, just in that one parable. But in his parables, Jesus usually has only one message that he even wants you to understand. Not two, not three, but one. So, so a lot of things are symbolic. And, and many of the parables, Jesus, the details, they're merely descriptive, and they're not necessarily intended to carry a special significance on their own. I say that to say this. Don't miss the message. There's a main message. Don't get wrapped up in the, the, the symbolism in parables. Don't get wrapped up in the symbolism when you read Revelation or study Revelation. Don't lose the main message 
And the main message is that Jesus is king, and we will be with him for eternity. That's kind of it. He's conquering king. All right? We also should keep in mind the nature of the symbolism. The symbolism is always less than the reality. The reality of heaven is even greater than the description we have of it. Listen, this is just a man seeing this vision and trying to describe it in a way that folks during that time would understand it. And some of the things that he sees in the future, he wouldn't know what they are. So he tries to describe them in ways with items that he knows and the people will know. Like I do. Yep. And so, uh, you know, we talked about head streets ago. Can, can we really, I mean, I got a gold band on my finger. I've seen a gold bar on TV. Hmm. I've seen a gold chain. But in my mind, as, as much as I... I can't even begin to see, think about what streets of gold is going to be. Translucent, transparent streets of gold. Can we even in our wildest minds even kind of think about what that's going to look like? Gates of pearl, not just like little pearls, one big pearl. That's a big oyster. Right? <clears throat> we can't. And so, so the reality is, is even... What we have here is even greater than the symbolism. So Spurgeon says this. I quote Spurgeon a lot just because he's, he's a boss. I don't know. He's just so good. He said, It is very little that we can know of the future state, but we may be quite sure that we know as much as is good for us. We ought to be as content with that which is not revealed as with that which is. If God wills us not to know, we ought to be satisfied not to know. Depend on it. He has told us all about heaven that is necessary to bring us there. And if he had revealed more, it would have served rather for the gratification of our curiosity than for the increase of our grace. So from Revelation chapter 4 through chapter 19, we have a section mainly concerned with God's judgment upon the world. And God's judgments, they're announced by seven sealed scrolls, seven trumpets, seven signs, seven bowls that pour out God's wrath. So Revelation chapter 4 introduces us to the place judgment comes from, God's throne in heaven. Uh, and that's our starting point tonight. So number one is the invitation of a lifetime. If you look at Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, after this... I looked, and that I looked, John, it's John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote the first, second, and third John. He's on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, he was a prisoner. I don't know, what's what's the, uh, is it the Steve McQueen movie, Papillon? Uh, him and Dustin, uh, Dustin Hoffman were in it, and they were on that island, you know, they tried to escape. If I, think you can, I think it's Devil's Island off of Brazil. Okay, okay. Yeah. That, that movie, well, Patmos, is a rock, and that's where they put prisoners, and there really wasn't much hope, so John is, is here, and that's the same John, the, the disciple who Jesus loved, uh, and uh, it, he said, I look, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, so here he is, a prisoner of preaching the gospel, he looks up, there's a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what, what must take place after this. Okay? After this is the word he uses there. Well, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 spoke to the seven churches, and after Jesus was finished speaking to the churches, John experiences the vision of Revelation chapter 4. And he said, and the first voice which I heard, the first voice that spoke to John in Revelation 1.10 spoke to him again. Here is the voice of Jesus. Jesus called John up to heaven through a door standing open in heaven. His voice was like a trumpet. It was loud and clear to John. Listen, John would know what Jesus' voice sounded like because he, he, he spent time with him on, on the earth. And Jesus calls John up to heaven through a door open it was the trumpet was like a trumpet that gathered the congregation of Israel together or gathered an army for battle. Uh, 
first first time I went to Haiti, we went, I, there's a guy that went, his name was his name was Don. He's an older gentleman, and uh, he bought the the chauffeur horn, and he actually had cut cut it down a little bit so he could fit it in the suitcase. Huh. And every morning he would get up at the guest house and blow that thing really loud. <laughs> and every morning when he blow that thing really loud, I'm like, I'd like to shove that. that no. <laughs> right now, no, I wouldn't do that. But it was kind of annoying. But but it's that trumpet. It's like wake up. And, and I remember, you know, in the military, da, 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 you know, you, you got Reveille and and you got uh, the the call to gather an army for battle. And he says, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So John will be shown things that concern the future, okay, the future. These things must take place after this. It's not John's present day. So, so here's our opening, all right? Uh, John hears Jesus' voice as an invitation to come to heaven and see. Who wouldn't want that, right? I mean, just a little glimpse, okay? From a heavenly perspective, he's going to see what the future looks like. That's just the first verse. I'd be like, this, this is all right right here. Uh, but it gets better. Number two is a throne set in heaven. Revelation 4, 2. At once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. <clears throat> so in the spirit, John came to heaven and a heavenly perspective. It, it's through the Holy Spirit. Uh, he also mentions that he was in the spirit in Revelation uh, 1, 10. Uh, he also heard a loud voice like the trumpet telling him to write down the things he saw and send them to the seven churches. If John is in the spirit, where was his body? Was John's body in heaven also? Or was it just his spirit? Uh, here you go. It's impossible to know. <laughs> I love, you know, you know why, 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 why fight over it? Paul, in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4, when he had his heavenly experience, he didn't know if he was in the body or not. Uh, this is a supernatural experience from God. Now, this is just him. That's, you take it for what it's worth. You don't even have to take it at all. Probably better off if you don't take it at all. But I don't think he could have survived and handled it as a man in the flesh. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been too much. Like you and me standing here, you know, just in this flesh, I don't think he would have been able to, to handle that. Uh, verse we find in chapter 5 that he broke down and wept it was so overwhelming because no one on, on in heaven or, earth or under the earth was worthy to open the scroll and look at it it, it, it tore him up because he saw that scroll and it's like who can open it and, and, and it, it bothered him it broke him down so much it was powerful and emotional and this throne was what first impressed John <clears throat> And it is the centerpiece of the vision. And John was fixated on the, it was an occupied throne too. It wasn't an empty throne. And everything else is described in relation to this throne. And remember when we started out, what we value the most, if we want to find out what we value the most, we follow the trail to what we, we, we spend most of our time with, our money, our resources, all our efforts, and that leads to a throne. And whatever sits on that throne is what we worship. So the centerpiece of John's vision is in relation to the throne and who sits on the throne. The throne's not empty. There is someone, capital O, who sits on this great heavenly throne. <clears throat> the throne is a powerful declaration of not merely God's presence, but of his sovereign rightful reign and his prerogative to judge. <coughs> uh, we can't think rightly about much of anything until we settle in our mind that there's an occupied throne in heaven. And the God of the Bible rules from the throne. Listen, God is on the throne. He's never, he's never left it. Nobody else has ever occupied. Nobody can. And even in the midst of all we deal with the shenanigans of this world, God's still on the throne. He's always been on the throne. Uh, and, and, and we need to understand that. When we get discouraged, when we get down, when we think like this world's a mess, yes, it is a mess. I don't know why we should think anything else other because the world's a mess. It, it's always been a mess. And the scripture says it's going to be a worse mess. As time as the closer that Jesus comes, it's going to be even a worse mess. And, and in my little mere 
lifespan that I have, I'm seeing things now that I never dreamed I would have seen 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And, and, and I'm seeing stuff now. And some of you have been around longer than me, and, and, and I've talked to you all, and I remember a conversation with Brother Don on the phone, you know, one time I was like, hey, tell Brother Don, you've seen a lot of things. Have you seen anything like this before? He's like, never in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, if you haven't seen it, I mean, like, I haven't seen anything compared to you. I said, but, you know, but the scripture says, you know, it's, it's all pointing toward the return of Jesus, which could happen any time. But I think one of the keys for us as believers in Christ to know is that God's still in control. He's, he, he's, he hasn't ever lost control. The world's lost their mind. But Scripture says that the, the whole world lies in the influence of the evil one. The evil one. Right? So at the center of everything is an occupied throne. And, and we kind of think about that. So number three what John saw at the heavenly throne. Now we're going to kind of look at things at, beside, beyond, around. It's kind of like, like the, if you can picture just the throne, just put it right there with God on the throne and, and, and everything. That's the centerpiece. None of these other things take away from that. Okay? Uh, that's why it's talking about the symbolism and everything. It's kind of easy to get wrapped up in those things and to begin to think about those things and kind of get follow down that trail, but that, that throne in the center, that's, that's why they're all there, okay? Uh, John 4, 3, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian or Sardius, depending on what your translation, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So the description of the one on the throne, John describes the occupant of the throne. He's like a Jasper and Sardius stone in appearance, uh, John does something kind of unique instead of describing a specific form or figure. It's just saying, well, it was a man. <clears throat> he had a long beard. He had like white hair. You know, that's kind of like we figure he looks like. But uh, you know, he described him as emanations of glistening light in two colors. White, jasper may mean diamond, and red, sardius. So uh, these two colors are meant to communicate the glory of the empty tomb. White from Matthew 28, 1, 3. And the sacrificial love of Calvary. Red indicating blood. Or there's also that could be linked with the first and last gems in the high priest's breastplate. Found in Exodus 39, 8 through 13. And there was a rainbow around the throne. The throne was surrounded by a green-hued rainbow in appearance like an emerald. Well, the rainbow is a reminder of God's commitment to his covenant with man from Genesis 9, 11 through 17. And around this setting of all sovereignty, power, authority, and glory, the setting of the throne of God, God has a reminder of his promise to never destroy the earth again with water, a promise that he directs his sovereignty so that it, is not the, uh, it doesn't go against his promises. And so then we go to number four as we continue on uh, what John saw around the throne, Revelation 4.4. 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. So as he's taken in this vision, it starts at the throne in the center, and it begins to kind of, <clears throat> you know, it, it, you can't help it when you get there. I mean, that's the first thing you're going to lock in on, right? Uh, listen, as much as I have a lot of loved ones in heaven, but the one I want to see the first is Jesus. Right. <laughs> I, I'll, see her, I gotta tell you, I'll see everybody else later, but I'm like, he's the one that died for my sins. As much as I love my other relatives and friends and stuff that have gone, listen, it, it's so, when John gets to heaven, the focal point is that throne, and everything else is around it. So now he's kind of beginning to see what's going on. Uh, he saw the throne, the throne, and the one who sat on the throne. It's the throne. It's the main throne. And that's where his eyes had gone first. Then he begins to look around the throne. He sees 24 more thrones. They're lesser thrones. <coughs> Excuse me. And on these 24 thrones were 24 elders. So you're thinking, who are they? Well, I'm glad you're thinking that. It's a great question. 
like everything in the Bible, and even more so in the book of Revelation, it is a very highly debated subject. Some see them as angelic beings. Uh, no, it's not. The best to, it's best to view them as human representatives of the church. Uh, people say, well, they're angels. They're not angels. The best representation is, is humans who represent the church. Why do you say that? I need some evidence, please. I'm so glad that you asked me for evidence because I've got it for you. Though. The thrones indicate they were with Christ. And nowhere in Scripture do angels sit on thrones or are pictured ruling or reigning. Okay, that's the first one. The Greek word for elders is presbyteroi. Uh, we get our word presbyterian from that, okay? Uh, it's never used in Scripture to refer to angels, but always to men. And it is used to speak of older men in general. But they're wearing white garments, you may say. And angels do appear in white. But white garments are more commonly are the dress of believers, especially in the context of Revelation. White garments symbolize Christ's righteousness imputed to believers at salvation. But so when we're saved, listen, Isaiah says that all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Okay? We have no righteousness, all right? There's, there's nothing good or righteous about us. When we're saved, all right, this is a cool thing. You know, we think, well, we're just born again. We, we, we get a brand new life. Listen, when we're saved, Christ, his righteousness is put on us. So anything that we do that's right, that's good, it's Christ's righteousness. Okay? And so, so that's what that white robe symbolizes. Now, they wore crowns, okay? We're going to find that the 24 elders were wearing crowns. And that provides more evidence that they were humans. Crowns are never promised to angels in the scripture, nor are angels ever seen wearing them. Uh, the word crown, too, in the Greek, this is the Stephanos crown, okay? S-T-E-P-H-A-N-O-S, -E the Stephanos crown. So what's the big deal about that? Well, the Stephanos crown is the victor's crown. All right, when they ran the Olympics, they've been running, you know, Paul, they ran the Olympics, right? That They had the, the, the wreath that they put. That was the victor's wreath, the victor's crown. Whoever won the Olympic game, whoever won the race, whoever won the wrestling match, right? They got the victor's crown, the Stephanos. And so that's, that's why they're human, okay? There's, there's too much evidence to, 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 to tell otherwise. There's also much debate on who the 24 represent, I'm not going to get into that because some say they're this group, some say they're 12 of them's this group and 12 of them's that group, and, and, and I don't want to dive into that very much, but, but I, I like a lot of John MacArthur. I love his commentaries, uh, and uh, he suggests that the 24, which by the way, the number 24 in the scripture represents completion and representation, MacArthur suggests that they represent the raptured, glorified, coronated church which sings the songs of redemption. They are redeemed, glorified men sitting in throne with Jesus. They're on lesser thrones, but thrones nonetheless. We are joint heirs with Christ, according to Romans 8, 17, and we will reign with him, 2 Timothy 2, 12. So we've got the throne, which is the centerpiece, and around it are 24 thrones with the 24 elders seated on them, and so letter C is from the throne, okay? Revelation 4, uh, verse 5, the first part of 5, I call it 5A. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbling and peals of thunder. So, you know, we, we, gotta, we gotta get to the worship part. So I could have skipped to the verses about the worship, but I just, I, I just, I just wanted to kind of set it up, all right? Uh, from the throne, John sees, John sees lightning, thunder, rumbling, uh, your translation may say sounds, or your translation may say voices. Uh, lightning, thunder, voices, and fire are reminiscent of God's fearful presence in Mount Sinai. 
They communicate to all associated with the throne of God. Once again, uh, MacArthur says that John saw a preview of the divine wrath that will be poured out on earth, described in chapter 6 through 19. This is not, this is, this is, Jesus in Revelation, he's not the little Jesus you see in the pictures petting the lamb. Okay? He's not the, he's not the Jesus that went after the one, you know, left the 99, and when he found the one lost and puts his on his shoulder and carries it back, that's not the Jesus of Revelation. This is warrior king Jesus coming back, okay? And so that's like a little preview there. Uh, before the throne, so we got from the throne, before the throne, the second part of verse 5 through 6, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, and before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Uh, real quick, seven lamps of fire. So before the throne, from the throne, we got flashes of lightning rumbling, peals of thunder. I think there's a song uh, somewhere there. <laughs> I can hear it in my head. I hear the thunder. And so the, I digress there. So before the throne, uh, we have seven lamps of fire. That is the Holy Spirit in all his fullness. The seven spirits of God is referred to in Revelation 1.4. In Isaiah 11, 12, he says there's a sea of glass like crystal. At the base of the throne was this vast pavement of glass shining brilliantly like sparkling crystal. Letter E, all around the throne. So we're from the throne, before the throne, now we're all around the throne. It'd be on sensory overload. I mean, I think that's another reason why he had to be in the spirit. Because his senses, I mean, the sights and the sounds and probably the smells, everything that's going on would be overload. Uh, the second part is six through seven. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight, right? Not your little chubby baby with little wings uh, strumming a harp kind of thing, all right? So now we're getting to the worship part. And it is introduced, the worship in heaven is introduced by creatures that you might see in a science fiction movie. Six wings full of eyes, four faces, a face of a lion, a face of an ox, a face of an eagle, and a face of a man. Okay? You don't really see those on Hallmark cards, right? <clears throat> I'm going to jump ahead, save time because we want to get to the worship part. Uh, I'm just going to kind of fill you in. The four living creatures are angels known as cherubim. Okay? Uh, I read... I read one guy's article, and he, he said they're aliens. Okay? They're not aliens. Also, the King James Version calls them beasts. Uh, they're not beasts. Uh, that's not a great translation. Uh, Adam Clark says the word beast is very, very improperly used here and elsewhere in the description. He says Wycliffe first used it, and translators in general have followed him in this uncouth rendering. So Adam Clark's not a fan of the, the, the translation of beast. And I think one of the reasons is because is it talks about a beast later in Revelation. And, and angels aren't beasts. Angels aren't animals. They might have a face, one face, two face, three face of beasts, but they're not. They're actually cherubim. Uh, cherubim are exalted order of angels associated with God's holy power. Now, for those of you that have been we're here like at the very, very beginning. And then go back when we studied about being a war on our worship, okay? When we talked about Lucifer from Ezekiel. At the beginning of this study, in Ezekiel 28, 14, Lucifer was the anointed guardian cherub, okay? So Lucifer was one of these. And he had the access to the throne of God. And their station in heaven is in the inner circle nearest the throne, and they are in constant motion around it. Okay? 
So, so we knew that, you know, because because Lucifer could come and go. We knew Lucifer had access to God. Why? Because he was, you know, in charge of worship in heaven at one time before he rebelled <clears throat> and he was booted, right? And so that that's their cherubim. Ezekiel saw them, and he describes them and identifies them in Ezekiel one four through twenty five. Uh, write that down. If you want to hear something just like science fiction mind-boggling, how he describes them on wheels and side wheels and the eyes and how they move forward and backward and they levitate, uh, he, he saw he saw the same thing that John saw. A spacecraft. Yeah, yeah. They, they, this, that's right. That's right. Um, once again, I, I've quoted MacArthur a lot because I love what he says. Uh, MacArthur describes them as the divine war machine ready to unleash judgment. Because the angels are going to have a huge, huge part in the divine judgment of God on the world during the tribulation. And so they're, they're ready. They're just kind of, uh, their multitude of eyes indicate these living creatures are not blind instruments or robots. They're created by God. They know and understand they have greater insight and perception than any man. And these beings of great intelligence and understanding live like their existence to worship God. That's, he create, that's what they're created to worship God. That's what he wanted. That's, so he, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 and all failure to truly worship is rooted in a lack of seeing and understanding. They, the, all the eyes they see, they understand. They understand their role. They understand why they were created. They understand that God's on the throne. They understand and they see the, the power of God and his greatness and his glory and his majesty. And they're like, we just got to worship. We get it. We understand it. We know it. We see it. And, and we got to worship. John describes four cherubim, each with a different face. Uh, from comparison with Ezekiel 1, 6 through 10, we can see that each of the cherubim have four faces at the moment. And at the moment, John saw each one of the four different faces pointed in his direction. So Ezekiel describes them, if you would, they have four faces. Face, 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 face. Eagle, lion, ox, man. Okay? So when John sees them, it's kind of like their heads are turned and they're looking at him and... He sees the four different faces, but each cherubim has that four face. Uh, the significance, I, you're going to have this hard to believe, I know this. The significance of these four faces has been interpreted in many ways. Uh, I'm not going to get into the night either. I know you're disappointed. Uh, I'm going to give you the one that I think fits the context the best. Okay, The description View the four cherubim in relation to the created world. The lion represents wild creatures, the ox domestic animals, the eagle flying creatures, and man, which was the pinnacle of his creation. The lion equals strength, ox equals service, man equals reason, and the eagle equals speed. Now, this is just a little fun tidbit I'm going to throw out to you because I kind of like this. Even though there is no specific connection, okay? That's my disclaimer. There's no specific connection. I can't go here and say this is found here. But I think from reading, I think just from the connection of everything back to Jesus and the importance of the gospel, the four different faces of the cherubim are symbols of Jesus as represented in each gospel. And there's a really good connection. Matthew's written, he's the lion, showing Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of the Jews, and righteousness. Mark, which is the ox, Jesus as the servant and the workman of the Lord, strength and action. Luke, the man, Jesus as the great physician and friend of sinner and humanity. And John, the eagle, Jesus as the word of God, divinity. I don't know if you've ever been to St. Francis Church downtown Paducah. It is absolutely beautiful on the inside. If you even get to go in there and tour it, it's worth it. When I worked for a mechanical contractor, we put we put the baptistry, the baptistry in there. Okay, that's what they call it. Don't throw rocks at me. If you walked in there and you're like, that's no baptistry, that's just the fountain. 
Well, it's a little pool that they built out of marble. And there's like several tiers of marble. And the water, the, their baptistry, it, 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 it's, that bowl kind of spills over and spills in there. It's like a little thing. It's absolutely little, a marble. I had to wear gloves and everything. It had to be micro set and everything. We couldn't actually touch, physically touch the marble. But we did a lot of work in there and I spent a lot of time. Up at the top, they have all these stained glass windows. And if you look up there, you'll find the ox, the eagle, the lion, and the man in the stained glass. The stained glass tell a picture and everything. And there was one of the nuns in there one day. And I was just like, I was like, this stained glass is, is amazing and everything. And, and uh, I was kind of messing around that day because I kind of, you know, I was like, what about those stained glass up there? You know, what, what do you think those mean? And it was the lion and the ox and the, and the eagle and the mansion. I, I don't know. They're just, they're just really pretty. And I'm like, man, there's the story of the gospel right there over your head. <laughs> and, and right there it is. And, and so uh, that's, that's, you can take that. I just think that's, uh, and as Brother Frank used to tell us, that's just kind of like a little side note, something to think about. But uh, I can't point you to scripture or a verse and say that's what it is. I just think it's a good fit, though, just with the gospel. And each gospel is written specifically. Sorry, did you say that again? I cannot. I'm sorry, Siri. Uh, you're interrupting Bible study. I can say that again. So, now we get to the good stuff, the worship. Number five, John describes what happens at the throne. Revelation 4, 8. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within day and night. They never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's it. That, 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 listen, that's... They do not rest day or night saying, Holy, holy, holy. It's constant. They're constantly repeating that phrase, Holy, holy, holy. God's holy nature and character is declared and is emphasized with a three-time repetition. Listen, in Scripture, verily, verily, or truly, truly. You know, two times is like, hey, pay attention. Pay attention. That third time, drop what you're doing. Because it's 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 you know, holy, holy, holy. There's not enough holies. It's like infinity, it's like a holy infinity. It's like, I'm saying holy, 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 holy. Just, there's just not enough holies to describe him. And that's what they do. In Hebrew, the double repetition of a word adds emphasis. And the threefold repetition is rare. And it designates the superlative and calls attention to the infinite holiness of God. You remember the superlatives in the yearbook? If God was in the yearbook, underneath this superlative, it would be holy, holy, holy. Mine was most likely to be incarcerated. But that's <laughs> you ain't made it yet. Huh? I haven't, they haven't caught me yet, Jeff. <laughs> so, so that's not all. They say the Lord God Almighty. The cherubim declare that the Lord God is Almighty. Uh, in Revelation 1.8, the ancient Greek word is used here. It has the idea of the one who has his hand on everything. A uh, title which God identified himself to Abraham. And this term identifies God as the strongest, most powerful being, utterly devoid of any weakness, whose conquering power and overpowering strength no one can oppose. Can't even come close. And then they say, who was and is and is to come. He transcends time. He has neither beginning nor end. He's always has been, always was, always is, and always will be. Eternity that way, eternity that way. Time is for us. We're on a timeline. He is not. Uh, so let's stop right here and take a, a picture of this, all right? Let's just let's, let's take this in, if you would. What does this teach us about worship in heaven? What else? Anybody else? It's going to be for a long time. 
Are we going to get tired of it, though, Jim? No. No. <laughs> oh, listen, you'll be able to fiddle. Them. Your fingers will never get sore fiddling. <laughs> it works. I mean. And those who can't sing on earth will be singing in heaven. I cannot wait. We'll be singing some singing jail. Worship is all about God. Okay? They, they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't around the 24 elders on the throne. It, it was all directed towards God. It's not about us. All aspects of worship should be directed to giving glory to God. Every time that you and I sing a hymn or a praise song, think about this. Is this song more about me than it is about praising God? It should be. It should be. So the worship, the 24 elders worship the enthroned God. Verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne who lives forever and ever. Listen, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Listen, worship is contagious. True worship is contagious. And the worship of the 24 elders, it's prompted by the worship of the cherubim. And since the cherubim worship God day and night, so do the elders. And the 24 elders worship, uh, uh, and, and that worship means to credit worth or worthiness to God, the elders credited God for their own work and reward. And Miss Leslie and I, we were talking about the reward. You know, the Bema seat, you know, we come before God. We, we get our rewards and everything. And, and uh, you know, they, they, they like, you know, we, we followed God. And, we, you know, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's, here's your crown. Here's your reward. And in heaven, they're like, even though we serve God, we give you credit for it. And, and, and so they, what they did is they cast their crowns before the thrones. It's the band name Casting Crowns, by the way. Yeah. They recognized that the worth and the worthiness belong to God and not themselves. They could have said, you know what? I earned this. I served, through, you know, I served, I followed Jesus through some, some persecuted times. I lost my life testifying for Jesus and preaching the gospel. It's mine. All right. Look what I did. Look, Look what I did. Crown. That's right. It's Look full. It's full. That's right. But they, they did. The crowns they received, they cast them back before the throne. And the casting of their crowns, it simply acted out their declaration. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And if God was worthy of the glory and honor and power, then he should get the crown. Okay? It, it, it goes back to him. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the crowns mentioned in Revelation 4.10, they're the Stephanos crowns. The crown of victory, they're not royalty. That crown, if, when that's used in Jesus, it's the diadem. That's, that's the crown of royalty. So that's how, the, the, these crowns, they're achievements that a winning athlete receives at the Olympic Games. The 24 elders, they're representing all the redeemed of God. They threw every achievement reward <clears throat> that they had back to God because they knew and proclaimed that he was worthy to receive glory and honor and power. We work real hard a lot of times for accolades and achievements. And we're going to see before God that they really can't compare to, to him. And we're going to give them back to him. Well, there's so many different things as part of the crown, like the crown of righteousness. There's, I think, like four or five of them. I looked it up one day and we studied it. I remember righteousness. That's mm -hmm. the only thing I remember. Thomas. We add it all to our crown and then just... We don't care about it. No. They worship God because of creative power and glory. That's a lesson that we, you know, when, when we come together, when we worship God, and, and we think of worship in the context of what happens in here, but it's so much more than that. That when we worship Him, we worship Him because of His creative power and glory. The fact that God is Creator, it gives Him all rights and every claim over everything. It's like the potter has all rights and claims over the clay. 
And because they represent all the people of God, the worship, the crown, the robes, the heart of these 24 elders belong to us also. Listen, that should be our attitude. That should be our heart. Another quote real fast. Uh, there's a throne in heaven that no one can occupy but you. And there's a crown in heaven that no other head can wear but yours. And there's a part in the eternal song that no voice can ever compass <clears throat> but yours. And there's a glory to God that would be wanting if you did not come to render it. And there's a part of infinite majesty and glory that would never be reflected unless you should be there to reflect it. And when we first started this study, you know, we started out with we are all worshipers. And everyone worships something or someone. And so the question is who or what sits on our throne. Uh, we'll finish up there to finish up tonight. If you want to look at a contrast from worship, uh, that's the last point. It's Revelation 13, 1 through 7. Uh, I, I, it says, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems on his horns and blasphemous names on his head. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. Its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And this is kind of one of the point I want to... And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? So that's false worship. And the beast is going to come. The Antichrist is going to come. And people are going to worship him. It's going to be false worship. And so you can see the comparison between the two, the true worship of the children of God and then the false worship. And so anybody got anything real quick before we One question. <clears throat> Won't actually in heaven there be 